Bubs, I'm going to be honest right here and right now. Spider-Man 3 is a weird-ass game, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that would agree with that. Uh, to its wacky voice acting that we're already familiar with in the other two, its darker tone and its off-the-wall death animations, Spider-Man 3 takes us on a weird, and I mean weird, journey, and a part of me is all for it. The choices the devs made for this game is hilariously off the rails crazy, and I can at least appreciate it for the laughs. Here's a quick snippet for example. Peter, what's gotten into you lately? Nothing that's stopping your gums from flapping wouldn't solve. Bruh. Today we're going to be taking a look back at the final entry of the Raimi-verse, that is Spider-Man 3. It's of course to prepare ourselves for the highly anticipated Spider-Man 2, and if you haven't already, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any videos like this in the future. Let's go over the history and trivia of this bad boy. Spider-Man 3 was released on May 7th of 2007 by Treyarch and Activision. It's crazy to think they took a year off releasing a yearly game to polish this one. Whether you can agree that this game was actually polished or not is another story, but they did give it enough time. Probably because this was the first Spider-Man game to be on the next generation consoles at the time, which was Xbox 360 and PS3. Now the last piece of trivia I found interesting was the playable characters in the game. You can play as not only Spider-Man but Harry Osborn as the new Goblin, and Scorpion which I completely forgot about. Let's move on to the story though. I'm gonna go ahead and read a brief summary of the whole game and then point out little bits and pieces I liked playing. Spider-Man is facing off against a group of degenerates called the Bombers. How on the nose is that name? As we see them blowing everything up with, well, bombs. A girl is strapped to a live bomb about to go off and we swing it up. Oh. Never mind. Sorry, hold on. Shit. One more. Oh, there we go. Your seatbelt. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. Thanks for flying Air Spidey. We get caught up on how life has been for Peter and it seems to be doing fairly well. He finally has the girl and the city finally loves him. But he does have a few curveballs coming his way. His best friend Harry Osborn isn't on speaking terms with Peter for obvious reasons. He has a competitor at the Bugle named Eric Foreman. Oh, sorry about that. I mean Eddie Brock and we see new gangs forming to take control of the city. Luckily there hasn't been any supervillains since Doc Ock, but don't worry. For plot reasons and the sake of this being Spider-Man 3, we see Sandman and the symbiote appearing to cause some mayhem. We know the song and dance of the story beats of Spider-Man 3, so I won't break down what we already know. We know of the fights between Peter and Harry. We know of Flint Marco being accused of killing Uncle Ben and the black suit using that as fuel to control Peter. And of course we know Eddie Brock eventually getting the black suit and becomes Venom. Let's talk about the extra stories we get contained in the game, starting with the extra gangs. We have three different gangs trying to make a name for themselves in the city. The Apocalypse Gang, the Arsenic Candy Gang, and the Dragon Tail Gang. These three gangs are nothing major but gives us extra things to do throughout the city. They were pretty fun, I really dig how punk they are, we'll go over their big bad in a bit though. We also get the first appearance of the Lizard on the main consoles and I loved that. He was on the Game Boy Advance port in Spider-Man 2 but seeing him on Xbox and Playstation was a treat. JJJ tells us of talk of giant lizards running around the park which leads us to following them to the sewers. The design of the lizard is pretty classic when we fight him the first time, but the second fight he- wait a minute. Oh my god? Scorpion pops back in to say hello like I've mentioned before and I can't express enough how disgusting this design is. What the hell were they thinking with this? The fight is pretty bland in my opinion but a shocking team up occurs with our hero and villain against another bad boy and that's the reappearance of the rhino. My god why did they change the designs of these costumes? This is yet another terrible design choice. This boss fight was pretty fun though. We basically have to tire the rhino out so we can uh uh do whatever this is? We get our first look at the Mad Bomber and I've never heard of this villain in my life. I did research and found he's a loose adaptation of Luke Carlyle who had six mechanical tentacles similar to Doc Ock. His boss fight was honestly terrible since it's just attacking an armed helicopter with missiles and he escapes in the end. I do find it funny that JJJ is talking shit the entire fight as he's cowardly hiding but at least we somewhat get a thank you at the end. 
Our next boss encounter is Craven the Hunter as he's searching for the lizard. This boss fight was actually a lot of fun. Craven used different elixirs to strengthen himself, and we also get an Easter egg from Calypso, which is cool. We don't fight her this time around, but we see that she's the reason the lizard had the massive upgrade. The last extra villain we see in the main part of the game is our big boy Kingpin. He is the leader of the gangs and using all three of them to get control. Very fitting that he's using everyone in his power to gain control. This was a boss fight I missed out on so many times when I was younger, but it is a very cool fight. We are inside the Kingpin's penthouse, and this is by far one of the craziest things of the damn game. At the end, you're just wailing on the bastard and Spider-Man throws him out his penthouse window to his death. What? What did I do? I didn't mean to throw him that hard. No sign of him. Could he have survived that fall? Well, I'm done here either way. Spider-Man's not even bothered by it. He tries to convince himself that the human being survived the fall because he couldn't see him. That's bullshit. And I'm blaming the black suit on this. <laughs> this is the type of storytelling where it just takes major left turns. Spider-Man does not kill people. And even if he was wearing the black suit, he wouldn't openly throw someone off a skyscraper and let them die. It's basically insane that they thought this was a good idea to put in the game. Oops, I didn't mean to throw him that hard. I can't see him. He might've survived the fall though. He has no superpowers and his body mass only intensifies the fall, but I'll go with it. It is insanity. We get a couple extra villains in the PS2 port such as Morbius and Shriek, which I found pretty cool as well as Electro in the Game Boy Advance. I never played that, but if I knew Electro was in it, I probably would have. The ending of this game takes a major left turn as well. When Eddie Brock gets the suit and becomes Venom, this little weasel blackmails Sandman by holding his sick daughter hostage. And it gets crazier. Spider-Man takes it upon himself to kill Venom at the end of this game. I honestly think the death was rad as hell, but like I said before, Spider-Man doesn't kill people. The design of Venom is a little wonky, but I respect the extra voice they added to the villain. I always found it kind of weird that Venom was talking with Eddie Brock's voice. It wasn't menacing by any means, and in fact, it looked goofy as hell. Let's not forget the beautiful ending of how the Sandman totally tried killing Spider-Man and causing a lot of destruction, and just as he is about to attack Spidey again, a cop drops off his daughter and it all changes. The cop doesn't even arrest Sandman, and him and his daughter walk off in the night with a happy ever after. That is fucking crazy. It just drives me, it just drives me crazy. That is so off the wall insane. They just wanted to get rid, they just wanted to finish it. That's, that's all there is to it. Let's take a look at the gameplay here. I'm sure they had good intentions on the web swinging mechanics in this game. It looks to be similar to Spider-Man 2, but for some reason feels terribly slower than its past game. And some would even say that the PlayStation 2 port of the Spider-Man 3 is the superior game when it comes to the fighting and web swinging. To be honest, I'm at a loss on that. I enjoy the swinging in the game, but I can see everyone's point on it. It does feel a lot slower. The fighting is crazy as hell too. It is brutal, but goes all over the place. And when you get hit, the ragdoll physics sling you around like you got blown away by a massive fart. There's a couple things that could possibly be missing to mention, but honestly, if I'm forgetting to mention it now, it's probably not even important enough to point out in this review and could possibly only decrease the grade. Spider-Man 3 is a game that takes a lot of weird twists and turns and throws us in a grim world of punk action. The changes they made for this game were weird as hell and honestly confuses me to the point I died laughing. But at least we had the cool death sequence of Venom. It gave us some fun villains on the side which was the big positive. Even if the design choices were awful, I enjoyed the encounter with the great value Kingpin most of all. Plus we totally killed the bub without even worrying about it. The gameplay mechanics were envisioned as an overhaul and I can see and feel why they'd think that. But me, as I'm sure a lot of other players would agree, missed the speed of Spider-Man 2. I give the symbiote coated turd a C. It's not bad, but it's just weird. If you've played Spider-Man 3, what was your favorite part? Leave it down in the comments below and don't forget to drop a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on videos like this in the future. And until next time, take it easy, bubs.